good songs in talking about theatre. You can, you can write some very good songs, in your opinion, within a framework, and, and perhaps the show isn't right. I mean, I've, I've certainly written some songs I like very much, but they were in a show that didn't work, and so the songs don't get heard. You've got to have every element mm -hmm. of a musical working in order for every individual element of it to, to shine. Yes, here on Times Radio, we know that politicians don't always have all the answers. So every week we ask someone who's not a politician what they would do if they ruled the world. And today I'm delighted to be joined by international lyrical superstar, Sir Tim Rice. Welcome to Times Radio. Thank you very much. Well, it's great, great to have you to bring some 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 li we, we, we lack some uh, sort of lyricality from our politicians these days. So hopefully you'll you'll bring a bit of that to to proceedings. We're putting you in charge of the world. What's the first big change that you'd like to make? Well, I don't really um, have any desire to <laughs> boss people around, um, but I think I would ban shorts on men over the age of 30 <laughs> in public. This is exactly the sort of thing that we're looking for. Um, uh, why, why, why at all, but particularly why 30? Why is that the cutoff point? Well, I think people's legs are reasonable until they're 30, and then um, they should be discreetly kept for intimate moments. You don't, I mean, I'm, I'm just turned 40. I feel like I should be allowed to wear shorts. Fine. I just don't ask me around to tea. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're banning it for everybody. You're banning it for everybody. I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, no, I don't know. I mean, running the world, I think, is 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 a obviously a nightmare of a task. I don't. I've never really thought about it seriously because obviously I'll never be in that position. And, uh, <laughs> I get the feeling that most of the world's leaders haven't thought about it much either. But no, um, uh, yeah, your your policy your policy on shorts is about as well thought out as most policies we get from other yes, exactly. politicians. <laughs> uh, so that's the big change that you'd make: angering the over thirties. Um, what uh, no, what's only on that matter. I'm, only I'm, on that matter. There'll be other I'm, things to look at. Basically, I'm, uh, on the whole, more angry with the, with the under 30s than the over 30s, I would think. But I don't want to make an issue of it. What, uh, uh, what sort of leader do you think you'd be? Are you, uh, I assume that when you're, you're working, sometimes you're collaborating, sometimes you're on your own. Are you a delegator? Are you a team player? Are you a dictator who says, I'm, this is how it's happening? What sort of leader do you think you'd be? I think... Um, I, I'm not really a dictator, but I'm not a very good leader. I, I, I do lead a cricket team, but um, that works because I'm not actually a very good cricketer. If it, if it worked, if, if I were a good cricketer, I think it would look like an ego trip. The whole thing would seem like <laughs> something which I'd formed to show off. And it works, I think, because I'm not very good and people who are good are quite happy to play for me, knowing that I won't outshine them. So what that says about me as a leader, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but, but so I'm really kind of saying a leader shouldn't be that uh, it's paradoxical. The way to be a good leader is not to throw your weight around. But there again, that's what you kind of have to do. So all in all, I would be a terrible leader. And how do your collab collaborations work when you are writing lyrics, but you're working with, I don't know whether it's ABBA or Andrew Lloyd Webber? How, do, how does that, are you in the room together? Do you work separately? How, how do you operate? Well, it, it depends. I think if, if I'm actually having to write a lyric, be it one that um, already has a tune, which I'm, I'm trying to set to a tune, or, or, or even be it one where I'm writing it um, without knowing what the tune's going to be, I think I have to be on my own. But clearly, most composers who um, like to write the tune first, that, that's true of most composers, with the notable exception of Elton John, um, I would usually obviously had to be in the room with them or or in close contact with them to uh, hear the tune, to give views on the melody, to discuss the story which inspires the melody. With a, with, a, with, a, with a musical, the story must be king and has to come first. And whether or not the lyrics or the music then follow, um, they both have to be inspired by the story. So I would be in the same room as my colleague for quite a while but when it comes to the actual nitty gritty of writing some words, I prefer to be on my own. I might be in another room in the same house and then I, after a while I might say, hey, I've got it and run over to the other room. But writing a lyric, and no tunesmith will agree with this, but writing a lyric takes a lot longer than writing a tune. <laughs> and sometimes you need, well, I need several days to get a lyric right. Um, I mean, if you think about it, a tune, if you write 
verse one of a melody, you've already written two, three, four, five, and six. They're all the same. Um, whereas a poor lyricist has to, by and large, come up with, with a different set of words for every verse. I mean, I'm not for one minute suggesting that lyrics are more important than the tune, they're not, but for a great song or a great show, I think they're equally important. Um, it's really interesting. Is it, I, I suspect the uh, musicians listening will, will might possibly take a different... I, I sense that there's a tension between lyricists and... and... <laughs> no, well, obviously. I imagine but, that, that, that most tunesmiths tinkle around on a piano or a guitar or just sing to themselves in the bath until they hit on something. But um, I think the lyricist's job can be, and in a way should be, something much more practical and... and something that is is almost more like doing a school essay because you've got to it's through the words that the the, the, the the story and the plot of something is more directly stated music is wonderful because it's it's abstract and to it, counteract the abstraction the lyrics have to be fairly direct and you, you, you mentioned that john it's because he would you you sort of he people with you or Bernie Top and give him lyrics and he writes a tune from it as a sort of um, he does it that way round really? rather than you being given the tune first and then writing the lyrics to fit. Yes, it's extraordinary. When I, um, I mean, I always knew that he by and large, there were one or two minor exceptions apparently in it, when he worked with people like the great Gary Osborne, who apparently Gary wrote lyrics to some of his um, on two of his tunes. But all those wonderful songs he wrote with Bernie. In every, in every instance, the, the words came first, which is um, a great tribute to both of them. I mean, firstly, Bernie writing lyrics, presumably without any um, clue as to what sort of melody he's going to get. And, um, and in some cases, you know, we'll be writing just a one-off song or um, which, which didn't even have a concept to fit into. And yet he kept coming up with great words. Um, and then Elton, and I only discovered this for sure when I began to work with him, only um, wanted lyrics before you would even start writing anything so all the stuff we did for the lion king or aida or other things the, the words had to come first which works in a way for a, for a movie because movies words and songs get changed so much characters get flung out of movies particularly in animated films um that that, 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 it, that it's good to get the words right before you, you send them off to the composer rather than sending off lots of wrong lyrics that may be quite good in themselves but don't end up in the film well, I suppose that's the thing, because you, you, like you said, the, the lyrics are there to do a job, and if the job changes, then suddenly that song's, that exactly. song's gone. However, so I suppose that, that, actually, that sort of brings us on to the next question, which is, if, when you're ruling the world, who would you have in your team? And you can have anyone, they can be dead or alive, but maybe, you, maybe I don't know if any of the people you've worked with before, maybe you want to choose some other people entirely. Well, again, if, if, if we're talking politics, I don't know. I mean, um, uh, <laughs> impossible. Uh, I... I, I just don't know. I mean, I mean, it's it's an impossible question to answer, really. Um, I mean, if, I mean, I, everybody you you can say good things and bad things about everybody, and and, and a team has to be a team. I mean, um, teams are too big these days. I, I I think when the when the cabinet has sort of forty people crowding around a table and there isn't even seats for them all, um, or there aren't even seats for them all, then 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 I think something's wrong. I think there should be about. 10 or 12 people in any in any any in any cabinet and you don't want too many views um good good views will probably be just as likely to come from 12 brilliant minds as they would from 40. But you've more. never been tempted you've never been i mean obviously andrew lloyd webber's in the house of lords he's been much more you've never been tempted into politics nobody's I've ever been asked. interested in politics and um i've occasionally you know over the years thought it might be quite fun to um uh dabble in that field but but i think it's it's almost impossible to do more than one thing in 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 in, in at, at at any dedicated level, and I had quite enough on my plate. I mean, running a cricket <laughs> team is the most important thing I do, and then on top of that, I've got the lyrics. So and you, um, it's a good point you make about the cricket team. You don't want forty people for that because you just got a lot of people who are unhappy that they're not getting to play. It's a good, exactly, it's a good yes. yeah, yeah, it's good, it's good. <laughs> Uh, because all political careers end in failure, what would be your vice that would force you to resign? What's the thing that would, would eventually bring you down, do you think? Oh, I don't know. I, um, well, gosh. <laughs> Disappearing to play cricket, possibly. Getting caught. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, politics-wise and leadership-wise, I, I, and, and other than in more trivial fields like the um, club cricket, 
um, I just wouldn't want to get involved at all in the first place. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you can't be brought down if you never went up in the first place. A very good point. A very, a very philosophical note, um, note to end uh, all the world on. Oh, the reason it was a bit. Well, we've sort of already slightly touched on this. Your your incredible back catalogue as a lyricist, and now you're rather than just sending your words out. You're going out on tour um, with Circle of Words, obviously a reference to Circle of Life. The yes. brilliant song you did with Elton John. Tell me about that. Why? Why? What you're, it's a sort of e an evening with Tim Rice. Yes, I mean I've done it quite a lot over the years, but very, very sort of you know sporadically. Um, done it for charity events, done it um, on cruises, done it um, uh, all over the shop, but maybe just once or twice a year. And and the basic format is, um, it's 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 the stories behind the songs and one or two funny showbiz anecdotes. Actually, I hate the word anecdote. I can't believe I've just used it. <laughs> but, but one or two sort of stories about how songs were created, about the people I worked with, like Andrew or, or Bjorn and Benny or Elton or Alan Menken, Stuart Brayson, a lot of great composers I worked with. And I have um, Duncan Waugh, who's a wonderful MD and a pretty good medium pace fast bowler. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, Duncan conducts the band, which is a small band, but we have four, four singers two guys, two girls, and they sing the hits and the flops. So um, it's mainly, I'm glad to say, um, we only feature hits because the punters um, like to hear songs they know by and large, but they also like to hear the stories behind the songs, why some worked, why some didn't, and sometimes earlier versions of songs, which um, usually involve bad lyrics, um, can, be, can be quite entertaining. It's, it's, it's just an evening with. It's... I mean, some of the questions that people ask me, which comes first, the words and the music? I mean, all that sort of stuff comes out. Um, and my, my thoughts about things that worked, like Lion King and Joseph and things that didn't work so well. So um, it, it, it's, I think it's quite entertaining. I was inspired by Sammy Kahn, the great American lyricist who used to do a lot of these um, shows, and he was very funny, and he had a wonderful catalogue of great, great lyrics, which he'd written largely for Frank Sinatra, but for many other great singers as well. Um, you, you talk about what were the hits and the flops. How many, with hindsight now, when you sort of look back on them, how many of them are because actually you think, well, with hindsight, that was a bit stinky. And how many are things outside your control? I don't know, The somebody six months before had a similar idea or the theatre burnt down the night. But how much of it do you think, well, actually, that could have been a hit, or, you know, with a fair wind or whatever. And how much of it is it sometimes stuff you write is good and sometimes it isn't? Well, I think you can write good songs in talking about theatre. You can, you can write some very good songs, in your opinion, within a framework. And, and perhaps the show isn't right. I mean, I've, I've certainly written some songs I like very much, but they were in a show that didn't work. And so the songs don't get heard. You've got to have every element of a musical working in order for every individual element of it to to shine and um you know the the there are there are plenty of of um things i've done which i thought were um deserving of of some sort of recognition but got none at all and 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 that might well have been my fault as much as anybody else's and ditto there'd be one or two songs that i thought well i'm surprised that one worked but it worked because it was part of a very, very strong score or something. The thing is nobody, one of the great rules of musicals is nobody knows anything. And you don't really know anything until your work is out there for the public. I mean, we, 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 we never dreamt that Jesus Christ Superstar would be such a big success. And that was our first major success. It wasn't our first show, but it was the first one that, 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 that took off. Um, and I frankly, most people turned it down. Um, a lot of theatre people turned it down, and, it, and we and we got that one off the ground by doing a record album mm -hmm. of the show, and that was forced upon us. It wasn't a cunning plan. It wasn't brilliant marketing. <laughs> it was something which um, we did because we couldn't get anyone to stage the show, so we didn't know anything, but we still had a hit. And what about Evita? I mean, you say you're not sort of interested in politics, but a, a, quite a political, yeah, uh, well, I'm interested, in albeit an historical one at the same time. Yeah. I mean, <coughs> excuse me, I'm interested in politics. I, 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 I just didn't want to go into them, but I'm quite interested yeah. in writing about them. And um, also, Evita is a political show in a way, but it's really about, it's more, a, as, as I think we said in the original handouts, it's a sort of Cinderella story of um, how a working class girl from 
pretty grotty background, got to the top in, the, in, a, in a sophisticated country. It's an interesting story. Is there and anything about what anything that's happened in politics in the last, <laughs> I don't know, six to 12 months that you think could make a, a good musical? Well, like you could make um, quite a funny musical, I suppose. But I, don't, I mean, it's, it, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I find that musicals that are written like three weeks after the event, um, you know, a Boris musical or a Liz Truss musical or whatever, or Prince Andrew or something, they, they, they don't, I mean, they're, they're, they're funny sketches, or they can be if they're any good. Um, but I think, I think you need a bit of perspective to really take on something that's, that's, that's an important political story. I mean, Eva Perón had been um, dead for 25 years when we wrote it, which is actually not a, not a particularly long time. Um, and, and it was almost an advantage that nobody in Britain, where we launched the show, really knew the first thing about her. Yeah. So it, 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 you could take it as fiction or you could take it as non-fiction. Um, and it didn't really matter. People weren't saying, "Well, that wasn't right." That, that, you know. The, obviously, there are there are, there are factors um, or, or, or bits of Vivita which are not factually or or, 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 or or could be challenged. I'm not saying there's anything that's deliberately factually incorrect, but on the whole, the the um, Argentine people who saw it said, "Yes, you 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 capture the image. It's an it's an emotional thing. We we needed to capture the essence of Eva Perón as a person and as a as a figurehead and as an inspiration." And, and, and as a dynamic person, that was the most important thing, rather than fact after fact after fact, which if we'd written it, you know, 20 minutes after she died, would have been much harder and, and wouldn't have been as good. You're right. I suppose it's that human story as well, and particularly Brits coming to it without baggage, without yeah. saying, well, I like, that's a goodie or that's a baddie, you know, a sense of a human story rather than a, a news story, which you need that bit of perspective for. Wait, so it sounds a bit... Will you, do you sing? Will you be singing? Not really. I, well, I, I, I might illustrate uh, one or two bad versions of songs with <laughs> a brief, a brief vocal. I mean, early, early, early um, iterations of one or two of the hits. Um, I, I mean, I used to do one or two of the demo records we made when we were skint. Um, used to sing on them, and uh, you, <laughs> I don't think my voice helped sell the songs particularly. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, uh, that aside, that aside, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, uh, Duncan and the band will be will be terrific. Um, Tim, so an evening with Tim Rice. You're in uh, Northampton, Wolverhampton, uh, Malvern, and uh, Newcastle. That's um, right. All, uh, all in th all in February. All in February. So I'm sure people can look online and find Tim Rice. An evening with Tim Rice. Circle of words, so they can get tickets to that. Uh, Tim, it's been lovely to speak to you. <laughs>